We're so glad that you've joined us either in one of our auditoriums or online because this this gospel series is so important. And I think for this week, I'm really excited because I think this will be the week that, at least for me, it was like, oh, I get it that my understanding of the gospel was too shallow. That I thought about that's what you need when you're not yet a Christian and you give your life to Christ or or that's what you need when when there's just a beginning stage, but the gospel, if you understand it, is deeper than that. And we are looking at a simple idea called fruit to root. And I hope this becomes language that we use at Family Church. I hope it becomes a part of what we discuss in life groups and, and maybe even sit down with a friend and walk through it of the fruit of our lives and what is the root of it and then how to move from root back to a different kind of fruit. So that's where we're going today. And as I was talking about the gospel series with my mom, she said, you guys are talking all about the gospel. Have you told them how to meet Jesus? And I thought both from her background and from mine, that's, that's really a great question because when we talk about becoming a follower of Jesus, we're not simply saying these are intellectual premises that you say, I now believe that. I've come to accept those as historical truth. There, there has to be a personal moment in there. And I hope that has been true for you. And if not, I hope it soon will be. Where you actually stop and kneel before the God of creation and say, Jesus, not only do I believe that you created me and that I'm a sinner and that you gave your life so that I could have life and that you're finally going to work everything out in beauty and perfection. But right now, I'm asking you to save me, to come into my life. I I surrender to you. The Bible uses lots of words about this, this transition, but that following Jesus is not just a belief system. It is a relationship system. It's a personal relationship. And as we talk about the gospel, I hope that runs all through it, that as we invite Christ into our life, the Holy Spirit actually lives within us and he begins to transform us. And we're actually going to talk today about how does that actually happen? And I hope this is really powerful. I hope you have ears to hear and a heart that's open and say, God, speak to me out of this. I want to learn something really important today. We're going to start in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. The, The tagline on our series is, is it good news for you? And frankly, often when we talk about talking about Jesus, what people hear is, I have to go to church all the time. I have to quit all my bad habits. I have to work really hard to be nice to people I don't even like. Sounds really awful. And I think that we're not understanding it and we are not talking about it in the way the Bible does. Because if it was for freedom that Christ set us free, he came and died on the cross and gave his life so that we could walk in freedom and in life. And I don't think that's a lot of Christians' experience. And then he goes on and he says, Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Pastor uh, Craig talked about Galatians 1 where he says, You know, you guys were doing well and, and somebody cut in on you and they told you a different gospel. And I'm, I'm some, some concerned about you that you're being taken captive. And what, what he's referring to here is that Christ set us free to walk in a relationship with him different than we were ever before. But we are in constant danger of being sucked back into various kinds of slavery. Now in Galatians, they were Jewish Christians who were in danger of being sucked back into a system of sacrifices and diet and works. But you and I are in the same danger. We're in danger of being sucked back into some kind of a slavery. And as we walk through this, I want you to to do some hard examination and say, am I really enjoying freedom in Christ? Is that what my life is like? Or am I really living with a lot of bondage and a lot of slavery? And you can be a slave to your old self, to the core lies, to people's opinions, to, to depending on yourself and trying really, really hard. So start thinking through those. And we are working a lot out of a book that is not only a powerful book that has been impacting us as a staff, but it's, it's the heart and core of our life groups this fall as we read through and talk through, what does this mean for me? And it, 
It was written by a guy named Jeff Vanderstelt, and this is a picture of his family, Jeff and his wife Jane and their three kids. And the beginning story in the book, he talks about a process that he and his wife went through because they had given each other permission to try to help deepen their understanding of the gospel, to become fluent in speaking and hearing the gospel. And so one day he came home from taking the kids to school and it was their day off and and Jane was sitting there in her blue bathrobe still waiting for the day to start and she was sipping her coffee, but her face was just downcast and she was obviously struggling. And so Jeff sat down beside her and he said, what, what's going on? And she began to just pour out the frustrations of her heart and the insecurities. They were living in Seattle and she wasn't sure that they were living in a safe area and they were sending their kids to public school and man, should they even do that with all the crazy things that are being taught in schools? And and what about their kids? They were growing up as pastor's kids, and that's kind of a dangerous place for kids. Um, would they ever come to trust Christ for themselves? And And were we doing a good enough job as parents? And she just began to pour out all this anxiety and frustration and worry. And, and I thought this was a little bit uh, teachy when I first read it, but then I realized that that as a couple, they've committed to helping each other live in line with the gospel. And so I have to say, I just admire this conversation as I share it with you. And he said, I want to draw you a little diagram. And he drew a tree with a couple of boxes there. And you see that on your outline. And I want you not to fill anything just yet. Just listen right now, and I'll give you something to write there in just a moment. But he started up here and he said, what are you experiencing in your life right now? What, what is the fruit of your life? It, it's kind of a crazy idea that we're producing fruit all the time, that the people around us are living with and observing and seeing the outflow of our life. And so he says, what are you experiencing? And she said, worry and fear and anxiety and frustration. And he, and he asked a tougher question. He said, why are you, what are you believing about yourself that makes you feel all of these things? And she says, I, I guess I believe that I'm in control. And then she thought a second. She said, actually, I'm not in control, and I feel like I have to try to control. And that, that I have to do whatever it takes so that my kids are safe, and they, they follow Jesus, and it, it just feels like it's all on me, that I have to take care of everything. And then he went another step deeper and he said, what you believe about yourself really is kind of a shadow of what you are believing about God. Now, now this is important. Not what theologically you would tell somebody else, this is what I believe, but what I am actively practically practicing in belief about God right now. I like to think of it as we've got a lot of truth back here in the back part of our brain, but it's not pulled up into the frontal lobe where we're actually experiencing life. And so he said, what are you believing about God right now? And she said, I, I guess I believe that God is unloving, that he's absent. And then she dug even a little deeper and she said, I guess I believe that God has abandoned us that we're on our own as parents and we're on our own in North Seattle. And I guess that means I'm really feeling like God isn't here and doesn't care and isn't paying attention. He said, so what does that mean you believe about God himself? And she said, I, I guess I believe he's impotent. And Jeff said, that was kind of shocking to me. Like, you know, Wow, that's like blasphemy. How can you say that? That's not true. And I think too often we try to, to help people out of the, the problem that they're in by shortcutting the process. And he said, one of the things I most admire about my wife is her deep honesty and her authenticity that, that she talks about what's really going on in her, not what's supposed to be going on. And so... He then moved across and he said, let's, let's talk over here about what is it that you know about God. Let's, let's reveal again and talk through what, 
do we know to be true? And she said, I know that God is powerful. He's the creator of the universe. He, he raised Jesus from the dead. And what else do you know? I know that God is loving. How do you know God is loving? You see, sometimes I think we, we think God is loving depending on our experience of the moment. Like, oh, God really loves me because everything's going good. And oh, God doesn't love me because everything's going bad. But what do you know about God? She said, well, I, I know that he sent Jesus to live a life on our planet and experience life with us and for us and that, that he died to give his life so that we could have life eternal. And there's no deeper or more permanent or more provable aspect that God loves us. He said, what, what, else, what else do you know about God? Well, that he is aware, that he is here, that he's in me, that he's working in our situation. And so if, if that's true, Jeff said, if, if we're in this box here about God, then, then what does that mean for you? She says, it means I'm not in control, but I don't have to be. That, that God is at work. That I, that I honestly can't save my kids, but God can. And that I can trust because of who he is. And as they talked through this, he said, you could watch her, her countenance lighten and her, her spirit lift. And when she got over here to, what are you experiencing now? And she finally got to a place where she said, I'm experiencing peace. Now, now listen carefully. The situation had not changed one bit. But she had changed, not because she knew anything differently, but because she had changed her mind as to what she was focusing on and what she was believing. And I want you to think about that picture as we walk through this, because I want to walk through that for you and for me, and I want you to make some of that personal application in your life. And I want to go back to Galatians, where he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That was an exercise in how she could learn to walk by the Spirit. Jeff was coaching her and asking her questions, but she was letting the Spirit of God change her frame of reference. And then he says, For the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not able to do whatever you want. It says there's two forces inside of us after we've given our life to Christ. The Holy Spirit comes to live with us and within us, and he's trying to not only tell us the truth, but help us to live in truth, to, to walk in step with the Spirit. But we have what's called the flesh, which is not just your flesh, your body. It's all of the old habits. It's all of the core lies. It's all of the ways in which we were influenced by our culture, the things that we believe because other people believe them, the things that were said to us about ourselves. There's this all collection of garbage, if you will, from the past that threatens to pull us back into slavery. And so there's this battle going on inside. And he says, here's the result of the battle. If you let the flesh win, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, which is excess, unlimited partying, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, which arguments and divisions, factions, fighting to get among each other, and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. And you go, yeah, that's awful. And it's really powerful statement. If you listen to the flesh inside of you, you will ultimately begin to exhibit some of the flesh fruit, the ugly, awful stuff. And it doesn't come full ripe like this. It often starts much more mild and embryonic. But then he says the opposite is also true. If we stay in step with the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is lovingly putting up with each other, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there's no law. You see, and I think when I was growing up and when I heard that, I thought, well, the fruit of the flesh, oh, that's ugly, that's bad people. And the fruit of the Spirit, that's good people. And when I wasn't experiencing it, then I would do what this bush does. 
I put on plastic fruit. This is, a, this is a bush that never looks any different. You can have it inside or outside. You never have to water it, but don't eat the fruit. It's fake. And I didn't realize that that was what I was taught or learned, but, but when, I didn't, when I was feeling angry and lustful and full of fight, what I had to do is smile and put on a Christian look. And I think so many Christians hear that especially when you're at church or with Christian people, you have to fake it because you can't make it. And this is a process that's different than that. So listen carefully. How do we get really the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? How, what's the process? And I want you to, to walk through this with me, that he says the fruit of the flesh. So now you start writing on the left side over here, and I've actually given you on your resource sheet over there on the right. It, these are the words that are in Scripture. The immorality, the idolatry, trusting anything but God, and hatred. And of course, that's all different kinds of levels of hatred. And the, the point I want you to see is it doesn't necessarily start like fully ripe fruit. It often starts with very small things like just desire, lust, fear, desire for control, worry, drinking too much, arguing, hiding the truth about myself that there's a lot of milder ways in which the fruit of the flesh begins. And then if we let it keep going, then it becomes that ugly, awful fruit that was described. So when those things are surfacing in my life, like Jane was experiencing anxiety, worry, desire to control, and if at the bottom level, it was not trusting God and because you didn't think God was trustworthy. So what is that? next step in the process, when I begin to experience insecurity or anxiety or irritation or anger or those words that want to come out of my mouth, what, what's the next question to ask? And the question is to say, what does that mean I am believing about me? And I think there's a couple of options. Some of us have a tendency to believe that I'm worthless and unlovable. The reason I don't think God's going to show up and do anything is why would he pay any attention to me? I'm nothing, I'm a nobody, I'm not a big name speaker or a famous personality. And that at the ultimate level, I, I think I am not worth God's care and God's love. Now, maybe you never say that out loud, but that's what's driving the lifestyle. And the second category is the opposite. I can only trust myself. People are going to hurt you. God doesn't seem to show up. So I'm going to have to take control and Boy, I tell you, there are so many people who struggle with that desire to control everything, to keep it safe, to make it perfect, to, to, to make it safe. And what that means is I'm trusting me. I think I'm the Savior. I think I'm the answer. And then lastly, some people just say, well, this is all way too hard. I just want to escape. And they may not be in the drunkenness yet. They may just be in the drinking a little too much. You see, everything starts with a small beginning of that working out in my life. Maybe it's just working too hard or spending all my time with friends so I don't have to think or keeping busy. But those are evidences, not that I'm living in freedom. Jesus set me free so I could work really hard to stay numb. I don't think that's how it works. And then if you're honest and maybe you need a friend to help you, you go down one more level and say, if that's why I see, how I see myself, what does that show that I'm believing about God? And that, that is getting down to the roots of the gospel. And, and you realize, what is it? what am I saying about God? Maybe it's that God isn't powerful. You know, I read about all those miracles and things he did in the Bible, and I have never seen any of those. And so we, we ultimately don't believe that God can or will do anything different. We, we are professing Christians and practic practicing atheists. Or maybe I believe that God isn't present, that he's not paying attention, that he doesn't care, that he's not empathetic with my situation, that he doesn't notice my kids. I'm, I'm one of 8 billion people. How could he even notice me? And then another possibility is that God doesn't love me, that he doesn't really care. And see, these are important to really kind of dig down inside of you and say, why? Do I have such a tendency to be angry? Why am I leaning on alcohol? Why do I feel like I have to control everything? And when you start really digging down and saying, 
that's what I believe about God? That my life is demonstrating this is what I believe. Maybe you can relate to that. And if you can't, I'd like to encourage you to spend this week. As we do our devotions, you're going to walk through Galatians. And and I hope that you will begin to really do some wrestling with that question. What do I actively believe about God? Because that's where the change begins to happen. And then there's a cool little arrow at the bottom. And it's got a Bible word that we don't always like. It says repentance. And I got good news for you. Repentance really has a very, a very cool meaning. It means the changing of my mind. That it, I think it even helps me if I realize that repentance is about seeing things differently. That when I look at that thing that I said about God, that he isn't powerful, that he isn't noticing me, he doesn't care about me, he isn't here, he doesn't know. There's a reaction in me that goes, that's not true. But I have to admit, first of all, that I've been living like it is true. And repentance is that active turning. And it doesn't mean that I have to feel terrible about myself. It just means I have to own it. I chose to believe those lies. I I chose to live in the flesh. I was listening to the old core lies. I was listening to my old nature. But now I choose to move towards belief. Remember we talked about that guy at the very beginning? Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. See, this is the admitting my unbelief. And now, Lord, I want to move to be living in belief. So we go through a process of repentance. And then we say, how, how do I know the truth about God? And you go back to the scripture and you say, how do I know God is powerful? How oh, he created the whole world. Go, go read Genesis 1 again. Read, read the end of Job where God says to him, stand up and answer me. Where were you when I did all this stuff? And get a big picture of God again from the stories of people's relationship with God. How do I know God is powerful? Well, he raised Jesus from the dead. That's pretty powerful. He, he, he does incredible miracles all through the scriptures. How do I know that God knows me intimately? And again, let me give you some scriptures. Go to Psalm 139, where he says that I was created intimately knit together in my mother's womb and that God knows every word on my tongue before it comes out of my mouth. He knows when I sit down and when I rise up. And he he walks through this whole meditation and you, you need to focus your attention on that and go, this is true. I choose to believe this is true. And then how do I know that God is love? Because he's demonstrated it. Not only did he send Christ as a total understanding that this is the greatest act of love ever, but as I look in my own life, he called me to himself and he's given me truth about himself and he has been there so many places in my life. And isn't it interesting, at the point of difficulty in your life, it's easy to completely forget all the great things God has done. We get spiritual amnesia. And part of this act of faith, of having, going back to the roots, is saying, I know what I believe, and I'm going to review it and talk about it and and own it. And what does that mean then? It means I am, first of all, designed by God. Remember we talked about the four key movements of the gospel? The creation is the key point. Well, here's the personal side. Not only did God create the world, he made me. He gave me my personality and my parents and my history and my spiritual gifts and my my intellect and all the things that are true of me. Those are gifts from God. And so I see myself differently, not as worthless, not as unnoticeable or unlovable. God God designed me, and not only did he make me, he made me for purposes that are going to be incredible. And then I also understand that I struggle with sin. That Jesus, the perfect son of God, came to earth, and it says he, t- he was tempted in every way like we were. He didn't have the flesh, but he, he had all the temptations that were on the outside. But we struggle. And if we don't struggle, if you give in, then you go downstream. And then you begin to live in the flesh. And thirdly, that Jesus is the only hope that I have for salvation. You see, one of my tendencies is I, I want to try to save people. I want to try to fix them. I want to try to help them. And there's nothing wrong in that deep, basic desire to see people get helped. But it's easy for me to begin to believe that I am the Savior, that if I say the right words, if I pray the right prayer, if I spend enough time with them, that I can save them. 
And that's such a foolish thing. I can't even talk to myself into being good, let alone them. And I have to come back to Jesus as my only hope. And the people I talk to, he's their only hope. And I have to come to, to again embrace that there are no other idols that can save us. And then lastly, God will finish his work. I think especially when, when I was concerned about my own children and their spiritual path, I had to realize that God had to reach into my life and save me outside of what other people were trying to do and that God would do the same for my kids. And I tell you, it's an impacting story for me that, that God reached into the life of my daughter, Megan, especially. And he reached her in a way that I never could have dreamed of and never could have engineered and never could have forced her into. And God reached her. And it was such a proof to me that God's working even when I have nothing to do with it. So if those are true about God and then that's true about me, then what is my experience of life? Again, remember, the circumstances don't change necessarily. But I am changed inside. But I begin to experience that I am loved and God has created me and has a purpose and I'm living with him. And because of that, I can have peace. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And that's a constant process for me to let Jesus overcome the world and to trust him. And then I can be kind and forbearing with other people because they need the same kind of grace that I do because they're struggling with sin, because they have idols, because they've got roots that are deep in them that are pulling them back into slavery. And I can't save them, but maybe I can ask them some questions to help them really dig down to what's going on underneath the surface. I'm afraid sometimes we, at church, we, we call it accountability, and really maybe it's just peer pressure, where people try to behave on the outside instead of being transformed on the inside. And let me tell you, there's a world of difference. When you actually come to a place where you believe in God's goodness and his faithfulness and you again cry out and you ask Jesus to save you and you entrust yourself to him, it's possible to live in a crazy, messed up world and have peace and love and joy because those come as you're connected to Jesus. Step back for just a moment as you think about your life and how often... Would you say, these are the evidence of my life. This is the fruit that my family sees, that the people I work with see. They see me being loving. They see joy. They see peace. How often would you say that genuine fruit is there? And I say that not to make us feel shamed, but to say, isn't this what we want? Then would it be willing to go through the process of deep thinking? And let's go back and look at this whole chart. This part over here is is really a very simple biblical concept. It's confession of sin. But usually when we confess sin, we're just confessing the fruit. I lied. I was angry. I swore. I did something bad. And that's such a shallow perspective. This is a process that says, oh, the reason I was doing that is because I thought it was all on me or I thought nobody cared or whatever I was believing. And boy, ooh, that... That means that that's what I was believing about God. And confession simply means honesty, saying the same thing as God says. And so confession of sin is, it's sometimes a painful process, but it's the kind of pain of getting off the grimy pitch that sticks to your hands so that you can be clean. It's it's so worth it. And then the, the turn at the bottom is so important. Not that I have to beat myself up or feel really shame and sorry but that I have to own the fact that I was letting the flesh run my life. I was not living in freedom. I'd been sucked back into the slavery. And I, and I admit that. And it's incredible by, by admitting it and externalizing it and bringing it out that allows us to let God heal us. And so then we go over here and the the right side over here is your declaration of faith. And I don't know why our brains work this way, but what you say out loud or what you tell somebody else or, or what you write down, what you say, this is the truth. It's, it's the same thing as a confession, but this is a statement of belief and of faith and of trust. This is what God says is true. And this is what I choose to live in right now. 
And I guarantee you, as you begin to learn how to do that process, as you begin to honestly talk in your groups or in your home and have those brave conversations like Jeff and Jane did, you will begin to find that more of the time you're living in love and in peace and in joy, which is exactly the good news of the gospel. He's come to set us free. Jesus didn't die so we could be miserable or guilty or shamed. He died so that we could be free. But we have to allow him to do that process in us. And when we do that, instead of cheap, hard, plastic fruit, you get delicious, beautiful, edifying fruit. It doesn't mean like, oh, I got to try harder to be loving. It means that when I see how much God's loved me and that I am so deeply loved, I can love you, even if you're not doing what I think you should do. So the, the challenge is to not live in slavery to your circumstances or to your history or to the flesh, the old habits and, and the, the old ways of thinking, but that the gospel has come to set you free to give us life, to help us to live as God designed us to live. I know this is a lot to think through, and I want you to carefully look over your notes and maybe circle the things that relate to you, because it's easy to to think of this is what somebody else needs. No, no. Start with yourself first. Allow God to work in you before you ever try to do this with somebody else. And God is in the business of setting us free again and again and again. I'm going to let your campus pastors close off with a couple of ways in which we can really drill down on that this week. But I hope that you have heard something that God has said to your heart today. Thanks for joining us.